the lesson this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, reading from chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Prayer for the readers. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And our hymn of preparation this morning is found in the faith we sing or on the screen number 2119, where the spirit of the Lord is. I invite you to stand if you're comfortable doing so. My mother was born 
1919. She was a Depression-era child. And yet, beside the many curveballs she had been thrown, including losing her first husband in World War II, she still was blessed with the power to grasp how wide and how deep and how high and how long is the love of Christ, that love that surpasses knowledge. If anybody came close, it was my mother. Now, it's not easy for us to grasp that the root and foundation of all creation is love. Paul states it plainly. It surpasses knowledge. We can't wrap our little pea brains around it because we're so far removed from the source of creation. And we are so caught up in the day-to-day -day job of just simply living, getting by, that frankly, and I think I speak for myself, and I don't know how many of you, sometimes it's a struggle to find that time that we set aside to pray and to meditate and to catch even a glimpse of how wide and how deep, how high and how long is the love of Christ. We're human. And sadly, we've come to understand in our own humanity that love comes as a reward for being good, for being faithful, for being kind, for giving gifts, for acting appropriately at all times. But that's not the kind of love that was embedded in creation. That's not the kind of love that surpasses knowledge and it's certainly not the love Paul's praying about when he says he wants us to be rooted and grounded in love. Because the love of God flows freely. There's no expectation for reward. There's no give and take, no tit for tap. It's a love that's just not inherent to human nature. Sadly, we're more inclined to stick with that Old Testament part. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Give me love and I'll love you. You do me bad, I'm going to do you bad. That's human nature. But remember Jesus' answer to that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So if indeed we are to learn how to approach this way of biblical love, we have to spend some time thinking about it, meditating on it. What does it mean when the Bible says we must deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus? In the book, The Fire of Your Life by Maggie Ross, there's a story of a woman. She was a Jewish Holocaust survivor. And every day at 4 p.m., she stood outside the door of a cathedral in New York City. And she would scream obscenities. And she would curse Jesus every day at 4 p.m. Week after week, this went on. She vented the pain that she carried and suffered as a survivor of death camps. It was her perception that Christianity had caused what had happened to her. Well, one day, Bishop, his name was Coleman Myers, he came out of the church, just happened to come out, and she was standing there, screaming. And he looked down at her and said in a very soft and kind voice, Why don't you come inside? Come in and tell me. So he, he took her into the chancel of the cathedral, and he left her alone at the foot of the cross. And on the cross in that cathedral, of course, was Jesus. And he left. And he waited for about an hour before he went back, but he never heard a thing while he was gone. And when he came back into the chancel, he found the woman on the floor at the foot of the cross, and he laid his hand on her shoulder, and she looked up at him, and she said, Well, he was Jewish too. In 1 Peter, we read, Jesus committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at Jesus, he didn't retaliate against them. And 
when he suffered, he didn't threaten anyone. He didn't scream at anyone. He just simply entrusted himself to God, the only true judge. The love we're talking about, is, it's not the Hollywood cinema love. It's a love, as Paul says, that surpasses our understanding. And although we're called to that type of love, we're called to follow in Jesus, follow in Jesus' steps. It's only through faith that we are able to do it. Because we are not humanly capable of that kind of love, that sacrificial love. But we can be transformed. We can be transformed by God's love. And you know, we try, we seek, we endeavor, we work all the time. We're, I'm going to be a conduit for God's love. I'm going to get it right this week. But so many times our humanness gets in the way of doing what we know we want to do. You know, we, we take offense at how someone acts or how they dress or those nasty tattoos. We hold on to past offenses, personal hurts. I was with someone this week that was talking about something that had happened many years ago, still holding tightly to that, I wouldn't do this because of what happened. And we allow, allow our pain to separate us from our neighbors, our friends, sometimes our family members. She hurt me, and I'm not going to ever forget those words. They never send a thank you note. I'm never sending them another gift. How can anyone with an ounce of intelligence vote for him? We do it. We do it. It's human nature. St. Thomas Aquinas said this. We must love them both. Those whose opinions we share and those whose opinions we reject. For both have labored in search for truth and helped us in the finding of it. Too often we just let those walls of difference grow between us. How helpful it would be if we could only remember that that person that thinks differently than we do, the one who dresses funny or who just has different ideas about life, is someone that Jesus died on the cross for. Paul says, God grant you strength in your inner being to grasp the depth of this love of Christ so that, so that you may obtain the fullness of being. We have this incredible resource for love and for becoming people who love. Filled with the fullness of God. Just think how our behavior would change toward others. And I put myself in that same category. If we could just simply be filled every moment with the fullness of God. No longer would we reflect all of our human frailties and our shallow hurts and our bitternesses and our resentments and our unfairness, which we all experience, every one of us. Instead, we would be blind to that and we would be just simply conduits of love and acceptance and kindness. Remember when Jesus was baptized, he comes up out of the Jordan River, and we hear God's voice say, You are my child. You are my beloved. With you I am well pleased. God's acceptance of us is not dependent on our performance or how much we love in return. God loves us for who we are, not what we have done. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And remember at baptism, you are my son, you are my daughter, you are my child, you are my beloved. I love you. May you have the power, Paul writes, to grasp how wide and long and how You know, we see glimpses of it all the time. We see it in each other. We see that love. No, we're human and we may not hold on to it. We see some people in history that we would lift, like uh, 
Mother Teresa, perhaps, Martin Luther King Jr. You and I see it. Every time a prayer shawl comes off that wall, or goes on the wall, it's knit or crocheted, and then we take it down and we offer a blessing that it wraps someone in Christ's love. We see it when we're reaching out to the food pantry. New mission project coming up, right, Lisa? <laughs> Stay tuned. We see it the way we share with our children and the people that were willing to step forward and do Sunday school. Travis is down there doing Sunday school today. God bless him. <laughs> Just when you send a card, when you make a call, when you pray for someone that's struggling, that's how we share Christ-like love. I have to share this little story with you I found. It's about a little boy named Willie. This is in the 1940s, and he was a child in a sharecropping family, which was pretty common in that era. And these folks had barely enough money to survive. But one time, through careful, careful saving, the mother had managed to save one whole dollar. Doesn't sound like much today, does it? But for them, dollar. And she took that dollar and she sent away to Sears and Roebuck for a mirror. They'd never had a mirror. These children had never seen themselves. So she gets the mirror, it comes in the mail and it arrives and she's passing it around so all the children can see themselves and it comes to Willie and he looks at himself and he just gasps in horror because his face is full of scars. Because when he was really little, he was bitten in the face by a dog. And when he was a little bit older, he was kicked in the head by a horse. And so his face was covered with scars and he looked at his mother. Mama, did you know that I looked like this all along? And she says, well, yes, Willie. Of course I knew. And he said, and you still love me? <laughs> of course I loved you, Willie. I loved you, and I love you, and I will always love you. I love you because you're mine. You are mine. I read that story, and I thought about the scars that I carry of my own sinfulness, the, the times I've failed and fallen short. And I think, Look at God and say, how can you love me the way I am? And sometimes I neglect my prayer time or I neglect to come to you when I need something. I'm, I can handle this on my own. And then I hear God whisper, of course I love you. I love you. You are mine. As one preacher put it, there's nothing, nothing you can do to make God love you. There is nothing you can do to make God stop loving you. So I would like to close this morning with a prayer, a part of the prayer as Lisa read it, as Paul prayed for the church. Will you pray with me? I kneel before you, Father, and I pray that God may strengthen us with power through his spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And I pray that we, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And all God's people said,